facilitators network uh, that's now being internationalized and kept connecting with people all around the globe, given this current year uh, and COVID-19. Um, we've been able to essentially create a uh, more diverse connection uh, going on. So welcome to uh, today and hopefully you get something out of it uh, in connecting with, with other uh, academics and other people to discuss this uh, this particular topic that's been time immemorial, um, or as some may say, some habits die hard. Um, so we're thinking about drawing and it working across a range of different practices from reportage and political co commentary and journalism to education and knowledge transference and visualization, advertising and influence, and narrative forms of fiction and entertainment in the way that we are starting to embed them within design and art education across the institution. Uh, so um, what I would like to do is acknowledge and respect the Pambalon clan of the Awabakal people, the traditional custodians of the land in which this campus of the University of Newcastle is situated and recognise their continuing connection to the land, waters and culture, paying our respect is to elders past, present and emerging uh, and recognising that connection that we uh, have within the institution, but also here in Australia uh, as a, an important conversation to be having. Um, so the Drawing Education Network has been established to critique, question and promote the role of drawing within design education. Uh, and this event seeks to connect global scholars in discussion uh, and collaboration through drawing. Uh, my name's uh, Dr. Ari Chan from the University of Newcastle, uh, and you can throughout the day connect in with the Twitter account, network underscore drawing, uh, and you can also look at the live stream via data.socky.org.au. Uh, this particular network was funded by a strategic network and pilots projects scheme established here within the Faculty of Education and Arts at the University of Newcastle, uh, seeking to build uh, sort of research teams and uh, distinctive research areas as we move forward um, and start thinking about the critical role that the creative industries has uh, as we uh, move into this new millennia. Uh, this is tied in with the uh, Centre for Applied Chaos or Fast Lab, our research hub here at the University of Newcastle and within the School of Creative Industry. Uh, our Professor Mario Minichello and P Professor Paul Eggleston are the co-directors of this. Uh, and it's a collaborative hub in which we're trying to link in and think about how visual Visualization in particular can help communicate research and collaborate with uh, partners um, both internationally and nationally. Um, our funded team, uh, you can see here, this, these, this is a team that submitted an application to get this network off the ground and operating uh, and start to be able to connect with you. And I want to thank all the different members from this team in uh, their expertise, expertise today in communicating and helping set up this new and virtual uh, online collab um, collaboration through drawing. Uh, so the program of events today, uh, we've got the session one, which is the keynote by Associate Professor Stuart Medley from Edith Cohen University. Uh, <clears throat> And then we'll be moving straight into session two with an introduction from Professor Mario uh, and a discussion between Stuart Medley and Alan Mayo and encouraging you to uh, interact with the Q&A and chat functions, which will be moderated throughout the day. Uh, and then we'll be moving into our breakout sessions in which you can choose uh, which one you want to join. Those links are there via the website that I mentioned earlier. Uh, so thinking about drawing for illustration, drawing for animation, drawing for design, the creative arts, and they'll be facilitated as we come back to a plenary session. Uh, so those sessions will be facilitated by the following people with you starting to think about how these uh, particular topics might be really relevant to this particular format that we're looking at now. So welcome. You will need to remember to uh, engage with Zoom via the password DITA if, it, if it's asking and requesting you when you join those Zoom sessions. So simply DITA, D-I-T-A, and you'll be able to get into whichever session that you like uh, and thinking about connecting with Aggie Studio uh, and being able to use some form of tablet and digital drawing as we move forward. <laughs> so we're going to be begin and kick off quite shortly with our keynote from uh, Stuart Medley.
Uh, he's an associate professor of design at Edith Cohen Uni University and has worked for many years as a professional illustrator and graphic designer. Uh, in his book, The Picture and Design, what graphic designers, art directors and illustrators should know about communicating with pictures uh, is a great read and really important for how we think about visual communication into the future. And I first found it out of him from his illustrations uh, in the book, Doing Design Research. Uh, so without further ado, uh, I'm gonna throw over to uh, Associate Professor Stuart Medley, thank you for joining us today as we talk about the future of drawing and unthinking drawing and undrawing thinking as your keynote uh, title. Thanks very much, Ari. It's, um, it's great to be here. Good morning, all. And um, good, uh, good midnight to Professor Alan Mayle. Yeah. Having a long day, I think. Um, so I'll just get my um, screen happening here. Hopefully, the technology is working for us. Okay, hopefully you can see that. So, um, yeah, it's a very convoluted title to this talk. Um, I blame Ari for half of it. He gave me the unthinking drawing uh, prompt, uh, which I took that to mean that um, as well as an intellectual exercise, drawing is a kind of a body felt dance with the, uh, the paper and the pencil and the self um, from Merleau Ponty through Lakoff and Johnson, Charles Forceville, all those wonderful thinkers. Um, and undrawing thinking is my addition to that because what I want to talk about today is the idea that um, it's not just the drawing that matters. It's uh, how we frame it, how we put the drawings together in a sequence and so on. Um, so there's my subtitle, uh, Visual Narrative Cures Sketch Inhibition. So Ari has prompted me to reflect on Lisa Thurlow's work on sketch inhibition. And uh, my subtitle has a, a medical analogy since we find ourselves somewhat cut off from each other today. So I thought I'd begin with this lovely Matisse. And I love this little quote, which may be apocryphal that uh, Alan Fletcher has put with it. And my real reason for including this here, even though it's kind of uh, encapsulates part of what I believe about drawing uh, I've put this here because the next three slides are kind of death by PowerPoint. But I promise if you um, if you uh, stay with me through those, it'll get back to the eye candy pretty quickly. So just to summarise, sketch inhibition as Thurlow, Ford, Brooks, et al. would have it. Uh, it's the problem that design students, creative industry students aren't drawing enough. And that's the lament of art and design schools and many in the design industry looking to hire our graduates. And these scholars and professionals argue for more drawing in university creative courses and in high school before that. Uh, so here's the um, taxonomy of drawing inhibitions according to Brooks. And this comes from Lisa Thurlow's recent PhD, which explores ways that these barriers to drawing can be broken down. So firstly, at the institutional level, so increased consultation between course developers and industry, raising the profile of sketching and drawing, increased rigor in recruitment processes. I think that's the only one I have a real problem with, but I, I won't get into that today. Um, education, drawing, tutors, and longitudinality, embedding sketching and drawing throughout the study years. And these are her recommendations at the studio or class level. So you can see across these two levels, it's a pretty comprehensive to-do list for uh, people like us to possibly respond to and address. 
And I think overall, it adds up to nothing short of culture change, at least for a creative industries award course. Um, and it's at this studio level, I think, where most of us, um, you know, if we have some agency about what goes into individual units or papers, whatever you call them in your institution, this is where we, most of us can contribute. And these are the um, recommendations, I guess, that I wanna focus on today. So Thurlow's relatively non-partisan on exactly what to draw. And so I ponder if there's a kind of a panacea, a single focused approach that would fulfill most, if not all of the requirements that Thurlow lays out. And the reason I think there might actually be a panacea is because of two strong trends for drawing, one in the industry and another one in academic research. And both of these trends, it seems to me, are around narrative drawing. So creating graduates for the evolving industry on the one hand and on the other, applying theory should both help to address um, this to-do list. So I'll ask this morning, what narrative drawing changes about drawing generally? and how might we teach it. And I'll touch on some research using comics, um, research into comics and research as comics. And I'll explain that how we uh, changed our course at Edith Cowan University to meet a changing industry and very happily made a drawing culture in the process. So firstly, the creative industries. I guess it's pretty clear to most of us working in them that the professional contexts into which our graduates are entering has been changing pretty radically. So one very clear example is the massive growth in service design. So service design in short is about deliberately developing the parameters of interaction between a customer and a client service. And controlling these parameters is really important because the economic basis of industrialized nations has changed dramatically over the last couple of decades from manufacturing to the provision of information and services. And services now typically represent somewhere between 60 and 70% of the GDP of most developed nations. And drawing is in growing demand to help to understand and explain these complex relationships between clients and their customers and between and within communities. And there's a, a nice quote from uh, Roderick Mills at Brighton University, which I, which I like. He says, drawing has accessibility and increasingly as it moves away from reproduction, it has the potential of storytelling beyond the image to act as a pedagogic tool and for social engagement and to tell stories and narratives for varying communities. It seems to me that's what uh, the, the DITA team is all about, which is uh, the right direction, I think. Uh, service design is a focus at uh, Edith Cowan University, um, a very tiny department of four people um, and became our focus about seven years ago when we took on my colleague, um, Dr. Christopher Quay, and that changed things uh, for the better for us. So these changes are being reflected, not just in service design, but in other design disciplines, for example, marine architecture. So in my own practice as an illustrator, what I'm asked to do now has changed quite radically and not through any clever ideas that I've had, but because of what my clients have been demanding. So one of my clients is Austal Ships. And once upon a time, they would call on me for an artist's impression of their latest vessel design. Uh, whereas now I have to do that for them as part of a portfolio of pictures showing the full context of um, a customer's journey on board a vessel. Uh, in other words, they feel they need a story to help fully explain the benefits of the designs and even the experience of a journey on board one of their designs to their vessel buyers in Japan or Hong Kong or wherever it may be. So it's been a very interesting and um, 
quite a fruitful development from my point of view. So I see these trends as harbingers of, on the one hand, what um, WJT Mitchell and Barbara Stafford um, have called the visual turn. So a general shift in the way society makes and communicates knowledge, that it's trending clearly towards the visual. And on the other hand, what's been described as the narrative turn. So Clive Baldwin said in 2016, narrative has found a place in the sciences, the social sciences, in the professions, as well as academia and in the popular mind. There doesn't seem to be any area into which narrative has not reached. So now we see narrative for law, uh, risk management narratives, data storytelling, narrative science. These are all growing areas of professional practice and academic research. So Paul Ricoeur describes narrative as any configuration of events into a meaningful whole, um, which is a pretty broad definition. Um, but you might notice uh, importantly, the definition is independent of mode of expression. So once upon a time, we might have thought of narrative as a written story or a spoken word story. And now it includes, obviously, a whole range of other um, registers. Um, Andrew Stefan, Vera Kane, uh, Jean Clandinen, among others, highlight the importance of thinking with stories rather than simply thinking about stories. And in fact, I think you could argue that the changing role of design as an input to decision making rather than as an output as a product is a function of this newfound emphasis on narrative. So what does a nor what excuse me, what does drawing narratively change about drawing generally? Uh, specifically in terms of what Thurlow is recommending? and how might it be taught? So my approach is to discuss the possibility of bringing these issues together. Thurlow's call for an increase in quantity of drawings and the expanding professional context of, for drawing and the increase in demand for nonfiction storytelling. These all seem to be pointing towards narrative drawing as a possible cure for sketch inhibition. Uh, a narrative drawing presents some special problems and these problems create some really great opportunities for teaching and also for research. Uh, there's some seriously exciting gaps in visual narrative research, which I'll touch on later. So the first thing that occurs to me um, about drawing narratively putting sequences of pictures together instead of drawing individual drawings, is that narrative drawing can put the lie to the, to the idea that drawings are necessarily vague or more vague than words. And uh, this is something I've seen for a long time in many places, even in design contexts where I think people should know better, you'll find the assumption that writing trumps drawing for clear, unambiguous communication. So um, Timothy Donaldson in his book, Shapes for Sounds, the, the history of the uh, Latin alphabet, says that images always need to be explained with supporting text. More often the real communicating is being done by the words. And Barbara Postema on narrative structure in comics says the words are there to disambiguate the pictures. But of course, words are often found in gangs with other words. And it's this context that gives the words clarity. Pictures uh, are much more rarely found in gangs. They're ganged up on by words. Um, and, but putting pictures together in narrative drawing can allow for this disambiguation that um, groups of words enjoy. Um, there are common instances of pictures being clear and precise in this way. So instructional design for assembly kits like um, the Airfix example here or Ikea furniture or airline safety cards. None of these are supposed to be open to interpretation. And if they're done well, they're pretty, pretty clear. Um, so here where the drawings are, as um, Thierry Gronstein puts it, visually and semantically overdetermined through their repetition, the meaning can be made very clear. 
just as words benefit from the context of the sentences and paragraphs they're couched in. So uh, later I'll show you an example of a legally binding narrative drawing. And I don't think you can ask for a more exacting uh, context for pictures. So in a more emotive register, Sean Tan's The Arrival, which I think many of us will be familiar with, describes through pictures alone, the difficulty with adapting to a new culture and acquiring a new language. And in fact, pictures may be used to disambiguate words. Uh, Barnard and Johnson demonstrated this uh, back in the 1990s. Uh, and this is a day one kind of task that um, students can do. We get them to disambiguate a word, in this case, the word top using pictures. And these are all contributions from different students to try and make that word more clear than it is by itself. So my sense is that we don't yet know what communication is possible through pictures, especially deliberate communication uh, through pictures alone, because we haven't rigorously tested the, the boundaries of this. And I think living in an ang anglophone culture where words are generally given more gravitas than pictures seems to make this doubly difficult. So um, thanks, Shakespeare. Thanks, Austin. Narrative drawing, I think, leads to thinking carefully about framing as a vital aspect of picture making and of visual meaning making. Narrative drawing enables communication of meaning through progression, inviting comparisons and spotting the difference. And for the artist, um, putting the emphasis on thinking more carefully about which moment to capture. As um, children's book author Diane uh, Kimpton explains, her children's books are not short stories, they're long stories told short. So the emphasis there on thinking very carefully about what to put in each frame. So the chosen framing of the drawing may mean the difference between the interpretation of the drawing as a depiction of a noun. So perhaps here we're looking at the emotion of joy or elation. Or perhaps the depiction of a verb if we zoom in on part of that same drawing. Perhaps that just means simply to jump here or jumping. So in these cases, high fidelity drawing is not what conveys the meaning. A stick figure would do the trick if it were frame, framed in these ways. And framing enables changes to meaning even when the drawing within that frame remains exactly the same. Even with abstractions like this one, framing can be the difference between, let's say, calm and overwhelmed. Framing enables changes to meaning even when the drawing remains the same. These drawings are at that mark making level that Thurlow recommends to lower the stakes for sketching for students. Furthermore, there are many collaborative opportunities in uh, framing these narratives. This example features high school student work um, my colleague and I uh, often go out and do roadshows to spruik our course to um, graduating high school students. So in this particular example, we prompted students to think about redesigning the cinema going experience. And what we get them to do is to work individually uh, to try and picture the separate steps of that experience, uh, a night at the cinema, and draw each step on its own individual post-it note. That's how you know this is service design, right? And then what we get them to do is to come together and look at where the experience overlaps. And in this little snippet that you see here, where the experiences overlapped between the students and they have pretty much the same experience. We have a single line of pictures 
and where we have a kind of a plur plural plurality, it's very early in the morning here, of experience, um, we get this kind of double decker or triple decker or quadruple decker effect. Um, so these are different experiences of the same moment. For, so at the far left there, how to book the tickets, for example, or how to organize uh, to go out for the night. So narrative sketching allows for this um, plural, plurality of views and uh, it allows for a speed and quantity of ideas, a kind of a idea farm, if you like, when you do this with, as a group work. Uh, many, many makers working in concert. And that leads to co-ownership and shared responsibility for the narrative, uh, which is one of um, Thurlow's recommendations as well. So the story is what matters and negotiating uh, your version of events, um, your part in the sequence of events. Uh, these are the things that become important in narrative drawing rather than anyone's individual scratchings. And because industry demands around understanding through narrative are growing, there's also a growing number of um, some pretty first rate prompts doing the rounds out there, such as um, Tom Wujek's Draw Toast, which I'm sure a lot of you will be familiar with. In our design course, we use these prompts, um, not as recipes to be followed, but departure points um, or, or things to be critical of, like could we improve on, on these uh, already pretty strong ideas? So uh, Wujek speaks of nodes and links in his um, process drawings. And of the number of these nodes and links required for clear communication of a process. So the nodes, that's the objects or the touch points along the journey or in the service or in the process. And, and these are, are always um, his chief focus. And in the examples he gives, the links are kind of relegated to arrows, directing the viewer's gaze and making the order of the process um, clear. But with an inquiring mindset, I think these links can become much richer than mere directional arrows. They can be almost like the verbs to explain how each node is related. Um, so here, I think the links become actions. Or they can become reactions. I really like this example. This is somebody's, one of my students' ideas of uh, how to prepare their evening meal. Uh, Kevin Henry, the um, product designer from the US, says narrative sketching gives us the opportunity to focus on the context of use of a product without the product having, having been designed as yet. And in fact, that designing the context of the use will obviously heavily influence the physical output of the, uh, the finished product design. So the process of storytelling can help us make vital decisions about things which don't yet exist. Importantly, narrative drawing puts the emphasis on the entirety of the story, not the individual drawing as an end in itself. Thurlow identifies de-stressing the importance of individual drawings as a key to breaking sketch inhibition. To paraphrase, the problem is that students don't want to sketch to plan for a purpose. They want to go straight to the purpose and they want to get it right. And of course, in service design, the planning is the purpose. And even better, oftentimes that purpose requires that the final drawings remain sketchy. It's about the clarity of the idea more than it is about fidelity to any referent. Uh, to paraphrase Ernst Gombrich, drawings that function in the narrative rather than drawing things the way they actually appear. And it's the sketchiness which invites and elicits participant interaction, very often the key to improving the design of a service. Seymour Chapman says narrative structures are never totally complete. They always require some reader input. 
Uh, and of course, comics and storyboards, sketch narratives can be carefully modeled regarding what's left out to invite that input. Um, this is some work we did with uh, a group of different students, including some from um, the Department of Business and Law at my university. And I would say as an aside, um, work with business and law students if you want to give your design students a confidence boost in the um, drawing department. <laughs> uh, Birgit Mager compares the drawing for service design to scores for music, which must allow for improvisation, input from the musicians or dancers who will interpret the score. A focus on the story is a focus on imparting meaning. The focus then is therefore on the audience, what's in it for them, what, morning, what meaning will they take away from it? And what aspects are appropriate to include? How realistic should the drawings be? Should the beholder be able to identify individuals in your drawings? Or is this a sensitive research context where ethnicity, gender, age can all be deliberately obscured through uh, the right choices in drawing? So each picture has a job to do and students begin to realize that pictures have tasks. And this raises questions around whether the right pose and framing is chosen and even the degree of visual realism. Each picture becomes about its role in something much bigger. Thinking about styles of depiction and degrees of fidelity for issues of appeal, identification, or deliberate de-identification in the case of research, thinking about degrees of sketchiness to elicit engagement and feedback. Um, drawing becomes a set of strategies that can be learned rather than the talent you either have or don't have, uh, which is absolutely um, central to Thurlow's thinking to manage um, sketch inhibition. So the aspect of visual narrative that keeps rearing its head is that the actual drawing is only one element of the visual communication. As soon as you separate a drawing from the next one by some device, a line or a gutter or a space or a panel, the composition becomes important. It takes on meaning. Uh, the positive and negative space becomes extra activated. Um, the sense of movement is accentuated. And one thing, of course, that narrative drawing gets you to confront is the physicality of the medium you're working with in a way that individual drawings do to a lesser degree. You have to think about the all at onceness of the multi-panel page. Uh, what's going to strike the viewer overall to draw them in? And what do you withhold from the viewer for closer reading? Narrative drawing accentuates material constraints. Where physically do you place the next drawing on the page? What do you leave over for the next page? How do you reward the reader for turning the page? These are common considerations for comics artists, but in a design course that must cover a range of contexts and applications, uh, this thinking can also be applied to basic packaging design. How can you turn these things into miniature narratives? to make them that much more engaging. So now I wanna move on to um, research using comics, into comics and as comics, um, as we've experienced at our, our university through our tiny little course. So through rough sketches and modeling the cheap materials, again, um, Thurlow prescribes cheap materials and no stress venues for the drawings. Students begin to develop an appreciation of this spatial and material arrangement of visual narrative. What should be on the cover to speak about the story contained within? What can each page allow and afford for the author's argument? And so on. And in our course, we begin with low stakes opportunities for the students to develop visual narratives for clients. We take next steps by introducing students to other departments in the university and researchers from across disciplines. 
So several years ago, we proposed the Visualising Research Initiative to the university uh, via the Graduate Research School, and um, they took up our offer with gusto. I think the results could be called drawing for the academy. Uh, another symptom of the visual turn and the narrative turn, I think. It's not just industry that wants to understand itself and explain itself better visually, it's um, scholars. In this particular instance, this was our students working with uh, graduate students in the journalism school. And this was a PhD project on the culture of surfing in uh, Western Australia. One of the very rare occasions where close representation was adhered to in narrative drawing. Um, the researcher wanted to be clearly identified in his own narrative and um, the specifics of particular people and the surf culture of particular places was very important to this um, PhD dissertation, hence the high visual realism. Uh, over time, these projects have attracted attention from across the university and some of our students at the undergraduate level get their first paid commissions um, to work on research projects for PhD candidates or staff. Uh, in this case, this was a visual narrative to explain cybersecurity to the entire um, university staff and student body. And this is now the official document to um, broadcast that policy. And it's had an absolutely massive impact according to the um, cybersecurity and IT services people. Um, not surprising given that the previous document was just a link on the website. We've had many reprints of this volume, which has been very satisfying. And we're never short of clients from outside the university either. Um, we do a lot of work for not-for-profits, as I'm sure many of you do. So this is work from uh, one of our undergraduates, which has become the national model for the Cancer Council's UV meter. You might notice the little micro narratives underneath there. And our undergraduate students are involved in our own department's research. So this is research um, using comics. This is an early visual narrative input for an Aboriginal health project funded by the Department of Jobs, Tourism, Science and Innovation. And this very rough sketch sequence was absolutely central to us winning a $200,000 grant to do more rough sketching. So we're working with Aboriginal communities at the moment to help them develop their own visual health messages. Um, the participants to the research will provide the visual narrative ideas and the drawings. Um, as the wonderful catch cry goes with regards to Aboriginal data sovereignty, nothing about us without us, which I love. I wanna see that on t-shirts. Our comics culture has begun to grow through this focus on narrative drawing. Uh, four years ago, we took on the Ledger Awards, which is the Australian National Comics Awards Annual, um, as a design project for our undergraduates. And this was a very strategic way to become a kind of a hub for comics information and to be central to the publishing culture of Australian comics. So it seems that even our typographic design these days revolves around uh, drawing. And two years ago, we decided we had enough critical mass to set up the Perth Comic Arts Festival, of which I am the um, chair. So here's the family shot uh, following the first um, Australian Comics Symposium. And this focus on narrative has now made us the institutional home of comics in WA. Um, the Perth Comic Arts Festival, or PCAF, now brings in more people 
to each annual event than the university's entire end of year graduate show. It has an associated research symposium whose output, outputs are a focus for comics scholarship in Australia. And we have a special edition coming up in the Journal of Graphic Novels and Comics. Um, and PCAF is really the flagship of a supportive maker community. Uh, one in which I, I hope it's easy for newcomers to see that all sorts of styles and stories are legitimate, which um, we hope is kind of lowering drawing inhibition through a kind of a decentralization of, uh, of the, um, you know, where this knowledge comes from, I guess. Here's uh, Robert Cook, the curator of Australian art at the State Gallery, launching the first uh, PCAF comics exhibition. We have two associated exhibitions each year with the, with the uh, festival. Um, so ultimately, as, as I said before, I think what um, Lisa Thurlow is angling for is, is a culture change around drawing. And I think the, the festival is a pretty clear indicator that we, we're starting to achieve that. Um, sorry, audio problem. Sorry about that. Um, and, and all this has come about uh, really from the beginning of just trying to change our own um, small design course to keep up with uh, industry demand. And more importantly for um, PCAF, we've had a really huge buy-in from real communities of practice with um, passion indirectly proportional to their budgets. Uh, and people whose um, taxes help pay for our institutions, let's face it. So it's a great community of diverse, mostly young makers who want to and can tell their own narratives. And you can see a great diversity in styles too. And of course, we rec recruited many students through the festival uh, when they realised they can come to study something about comics at a university level. Their, their, their eyes light up. And this growth in comics culture has connected us to other places of comics culture, um, including Newcastle now, which is great to know. Good to be a part of um, the nascent uh, den. Um, we have, with PCAF, we have sister festivals, including the Lakes International Comic Art Festival in the UK, uh, the Lyon Bédet Festival in France, and growing opportunities for study exchanges for our students, um, including with the University of Sassari in Sardinia, uh, who we worked with on this particular project about um, refugees, post-war refugees in Italy. And the Perth Comics Art Festival has, of course, flushed out all the comics-friendly academics from my institution uh, within other disciplines. And th there are a few here and there. Um, some in the health sciences, which is great to see. Um, some in the arts, as you might expect. And uh, my uh, great friend and colleague here, Deborah Dudek, uh, who works in the English department. So um, we've begun by trying to bring the school's disciplines together in first year. There's a range of what we call core units. And one of those is called storytelling and meaning. And a strategy that uh, Deborah and I developed um, was to present a lecture as a conversation between a designer and a writer, both with a passion for comics, discussing our different, um, but also shared views of this kind of storytelling and meaning making. And this is followed up by uh, a module of tutes for the first years. So the subtext of our presentation and our tutorials is that all should draw and all should write. And we, uh, in this particular discussion, I put it up here, I'll, I'll put a link on this, hopefully uh, when this is um, up online um, and published, uh, 
you can activate the link and anybody that's interested can see this conversation between Deborah and myself. What we're really talking about is um, the differences in focalization, uh, which if you're not familiar is a, a narratological concept. Uh, we're interested in um, the differences between writing and um, writing with text and writing with pictures around this idea of focalization, which in short is like who, who sees and who gets to be seen. So whose eyes are we seeing through when we read the narrative? Um, I mentioned before um, some of the special research opportunities presented by narrative drawing. And I think for me, the one that's looking really exciting is around this idea of focalization. So this, this area I think is, is wide open. This is um, a piece that I've been working on with the Center for Social Impact, uh, who employs one of our graduates in service design. I'll just zoom in a bit on this if I can. Um, so essentially what this is describing is a new service around homelessness. And what we have here is a kind of color coded journeys. This is a timeline reading from left to right, color coded journeys of three different um, personas, de-identified personas based on real data. Uh, going through the service. So the yellow service is, is the yellow part of the service described here is the, the spine of it, the behind the scenes. And uh, the blue is uh, one persona that would ac uh, access that service and the kind of peach color is another. And what interests me from a research point of view here is that um, we've got three personas that the narrative is focalized through. So I'm very interested in how different readers come to this, reading three narratives concurrently for a start, but who they, who they identify with and, and why. And one of the areas that's got a lot of potential, I think, in narratology for comics is around what they call unnatural narratives. So uh, there's a whole bunch of discussion around what is an unnatural narrative. Comics get away with a lot because they're such a strange and lively medium anyway. But one example of an unnatural narrative is a second person narrative. So the author addressing the reader as you. And a lot of research in um, narratology around writing says that the you is more or less a substitute first person or third person. But I think in this, in this case with um, service design narratives like this one, where they're visual uh, and where the service is being offered to particular people, the people reading it have to take that you um, at face value. Uh, so it's, it's, as you can see from my mumbling, it's a, it's a very complex um, area to get to grips with. It gets even more complicated where the you being referred to is, um, is a kind of a, a legal understanding. So this to me is like one of the really exciting areas in narrative drawing is comics contracts. So there's a growing area of um, legal practice um, comes under the umbrella of legal design, which want, once upon a time meant kind of better writing uh, for uh, understanding agreements, but now includes like literal graphic design and um, comic books as contracts, as worker contracts. So this is an example from uh, the lawyer Robert DeRoy based in Cape Town. This is uh, his concept um, as visualized by uh, this team, Gincom. Very visual, pretty self-explanatory, but here this second person, you being referred to, 
um, the person that's kind of being referred to here has to understand that when they read the, the comic and they're, they're signing up to something legally binding. So it's, uh, it's definitely not a substitute first person or substitute third person. It's a legally binding second person. So very complex area of narratology and uh, very rich pickings for those of us interested in um, visual narrative, I think. So I've been uh, a consultant with uh, lawyers over at the University of Western Australia, trying to help them make better comics contracts. And one of the interesting things for me working with the lawyers is that it throws into sharp relief some of the benefits I just described about narrative drawing. You really do realise that the ability to draw is just a small part of a greater whole with regards to clear communication. So one of the lawyers showed me um, some of their work using a program called Pixton. I'm not sure if you've seen this online. It's kind of an online comics making um, app. And the characters in there, you get a lot of ready-made characters and they work a bit like um, paper dolls. You can kind of bend them around, move them into different poses. Um, so it, it enables um, that raw skill, I suppose, of drawing individual drawings. But of course, what it can't do for you is decide how to frame the pictures, um, how to angle the drawing, how to uh, focalize basically and ocularize the, um, the sequence of pictures. So, with a range of digital comic making tools available online, lawyers intent on, um, shall we say, literally drawing up a contract can make their own comics. But before they begin, I think they really need to be aware of the conventions of comics and some of the rudiments of visual communication. And also it's a very expensive way to make comics. I think we can do it for them uh, more cheaply. I don't know many illustrators that get paid the same rate as lawyers do by the hour. Um, this strong presence of comics at our institution has begun to attract um, research students of very uh, strong caliber uh, that are interested in visual narrative. At the moment, we have three doing research into comics and narrative drawing, including the Australian comics legend, Bruce Mutard. Uh, Bruce should have his PhD finished by the end of this year. Here's the cover he's designed for it. So he's getting close and it's a really wonderful work. And I think finally, we really get a sense that we're making progress um, when our scholarship goes meta. So this finally is comics, uh, research as comics. So we've looked at uh, research using comics, research into comics. This is research as comics. So this is um, a piece I did with um, Helen Cara in the UK and Bruce Mutard. Um, describing uh, a day we did uh, of sketch noting of different comic scholars at the Lakes International Comics Art Festival in the UK and looking at the disparate approaches to comic scholarship. Uh, but then we drew it up as a, as a comic. So um, walking the talk, as they say. And this is on its way to being published in the Journal of Graphic Novels and Comics. And here's another piece that Bruce and I have done together about comics and the law, which is already published in the much more conservative law review of the University of Western Australia. So it seems professionals and academics and um, even the most conservative disciplines and practices are crying out for help with better ways of understanding and explaining themselves. 
and um, people like us should be poised and ready to help. And I think we can be if we focus on narrative drawing when we do focus on drawing. So seven years ago, our department took on service design um, and we were able to change our courses and our units, um, I guess because we're a small, very small department and we weren't stepping on too many toes. Um, so I think it kind of shows the power of individuals, but only if, you know, uh, scholars have some agency to translate their research focus in my case on comics and in Chris's on service design uh, to translate that into teaching action. Um, and that idea of agency is why I focused on the, that studio level of um, Thurlow's uh, recommendations. But I think a change even here can lead to real institutional change and cultural change around um, drawing in a course. But as I said before, uh, the real panacea to boost your design students' drawing confidence is to get them to work with business and law students. And that's it from me this morning. Thanks for listening and watching, of course. Sorry, <laughs> just got a bit of an audio problem. Thank you, Stuart, for a bit of a directional focus within visual narrative as we move forward to sort of think about. Oh, sorry, where are we at? Sorry. <laughs> right, I had a few issues. Yeah, <laughs> that's bound to happen. Uh, so, thank you, Stuart, for a bit of a directional focus on thinking about. Uh, visual narrative as we move forward in the process of drawing, working within visual narrative, uh, within design, within service design, within um, how we can start to democratize the process and perhaps decolonize the process of thinking about storytelling as a way of moving forward and, and having, a, uh, you know, being able to help and assist other people visualize and communicate the complexities of maybe their disciplines, but also the complexity of how drawings communicate um, and, and maybe how writing has dominated that exp explanation of the process for thinking about um, you know, the power of drawing and, and its possibilities for communicating across language barriers perhaps, um, or with, as you, as you rightly um, sort of said, doing research with indigenous communities rather than, <laughs> um, and, and with, with them in that, in that case study that you represented. Yeah, and, not on them. <laughs> and not, not on them as we, uh, exactly, is that, as, as we want to move forward. Um, you presented a range of really great uh, case studies, not only happening within the academy and your particular institution, but things that are probably resonating with a lot of uh, the people watching and attending this particular talk uh, as, as they um, engage with other areas of, of not only business, but other areas of their institutions and, and thinking about how students come in with that sense of in, in inhibition and perhaps uh, the clients or perhaps the people that are, you're doing research with and how we can sort of use visual narrative particularly uh, to help communicate how to tell stories and how story is so important in in whatever we're talking about. Um, I really love the example of the comics contract. I think that's pretty amazing uh, concept that, that, that those disciplines and that the particularly conservative disciplines can start to move to using visual narrative and visualizations as a way of uh, communicating effectively with, with people that you know, have complex um, ways of, of thinking about legal, <laughs> le legalese. That's the, been the real eye opener to me is like, I, that never would have occurred to me that this is something we could do as graphic designers or comics artists. Yeah. Um, we were approached by the lawyers, you know, to say, we think we need this and we don't know who's the right person to approach, but 
you guys can draw so you can give us some advice on it yeah so that was it was a shock really yeah i think you presented some really great examples of two of how to unpack that in the beginning for students so they can work towards that and build their own passion for creative practice into something that communicates rather than perhaps maybe our just our understanding of creative arts and our art on, on design illustration focus but starting to also see how students would transition and you can build a festival around that process and you can start to exhibit their passion but direct it in a way that helps other people communicate and and lawyers and and other parts of you know perhaps the medical industry as well as another area that's starting to burgeon in this in this space i know here in newcastle we've got some collaborations with nib uh, that have that have used these sorts of strategies uh, and drawings uh, in the past as well so it's kind of a fascinating area of investigation and, and I'm really looking forward to your discussion with Alan as well shortly, um, which, which, which will be great. So um, thank, you for, thank you for doing the keynote this morning. Um, and what we're going to do is take a little bit of a short break now as we, um, as, uh, as we um, move forward. So for, the, for people watching via the webinar link, um, make sure that you're, you know, you can, jump into the next webinar. We're gonna begin that at around uh, 10.30 on the dot um, to give a bit of an introduction to uh, Stuart and, and Alan in this case. Um, um, but yeah, so hopefully a couple of those great ideas around how thinking about drawing works and particularly in a design focus and service design focus and that shift as we move forward into the into this uh, millennia, essentially, how we're how we're changing and thinking. So, uh, thanks so much, Stuart, for that um, this morning, and we'll we'll jump into the next webinar at ten thirty. Thanks, Aaron. No worries. Thank you, Stuart. Thanks. Well, welcome back, everybody. Um, thank you for uh, everyone's attendance. Uh, all over the world. Um, my name is uh, Professor Mario Minichiello. Uh, I work in the creative industries here and it's my pleasure to uh, first of all thank Stuart for uh, the wonderful journey that you, we've taken through um, the way that uh, the creative industries in Australia and in your particular academy is starting to use drawing um, as really in different ways and as a different tool and I think there's three elements here before I introduce um, uh, Alan Mayle. Uh, we have a very timely uh, discussion here. Um, I think it's timely because so much is now changing, um, not simply because of the uh, technology, technology drives so much change, but also because of the attitudes that are, that are now prevailing, having spent quite a while now our disciplines in the traditional academy. And so we're finding that the basically drawing um, is a tool that has great agency, it has not just the agency that it's had in the past, which is to render things into its historical formats, the things that we've done in the past and how we can reflect on, on the, the power of drawing and creativity and narrative drawing and capture it in frames and capture it in museums, but how it's being used as a future tool through narrative to predict some of the future uncertainties and some of the chaotic future that we're going into. This is really important because the second element is that we are in an academy that is both traditional around the world, but also in really increasingly corporatized and monetized. Uh, we had a, um, an advisory group here that adv advises the Australian government when uh, commenting on the future of the academy and, and students uh, making choices to come to university, that it was the same choice as buying a toaster. Um, we know that education is not like buying an object or a toaster. It's about uh, becoming a fully uh, functioning human. It's about self-actuating and, and finding your way forward. So it's really important that we have these kind of discussions about these new tools that not just affect how we do things outside of ourselves, but how we do things inside. And I think the academy uh, that we're all in is uh, concerned with STEM 
and STEM is very good at understanding the outside world, whereas art and design and creativity is about discovering our interior selves and being able to speculate the future of uh, not simply business and law or, or science or biology, but actually about humanity and how what it is to be humans into the future. And that, I think, is the third element that, that we're looking in this discussion, which is this unique capacity that humans have beyond any other species to actually imagine things that don't exist. Not just things, but also experiences and stories that don't exist. We make things up. And in that making things up, that makes us unique as a species, um, partly because we have such a massive brain. Uh, our brain is, is some kind of biological accident and we are actually out of proportion to anything else, any other species on earth. And in that brain, which is a massive thing that takes up 10% of our energy, 10% of our energy is just ticking over our brain. We have this thing called a mind. And inside the mind, uh, there's this quite extraordinary thing which enables us to imagine. And in the parlance of today, that would be something that is a, a virtual space because that's the, the, the kind of parlance of the day. In the past, it would have been called spiritual or ethereal, but it's invisible. And in that invisible space that we create from the physical brain, we do things that are to do with imagination and creativity. That makes us unique. Uh, and it makes this really a very interesting prospect for an academy that is often uh, very, finds it very difficult to be able to frame what we do. So this is, again, an extremely interesting discussion. So to continue with this discussion, uh, and I would like everybody, please, to, there is, as you will see um, as we go on, there is a space bar for you to put questions as part of the discussion um, as we go through this. I'd like to introduce... Um, uh, the, the person charged with chairing this discussion uh, and a great friend of, of, of mine and well known around the world, uh, the wonderful uh, Professor Alan Mayle, who is also uh, a conjoint professor at the University of Newcastle in the creative industries, which we're very proud about. Uh, Alan is uh, an unbelievable illustrator, writer and academic. Um, he has directed the illustration program at Falmouth for over 20 years uh, and led it to incredible international national success, distinctiveness of, of its excellence in the provision that it uh, gives the world. He was promoted to professor in 2009, um, has given many, many keynotes internationally. Um, he is an authority on communication and cultural skills, uh, professional practice, science and knowledge bearing illustration. He, he uh, contributes widely to debates in a range of journal and conferences, magazines and learned papers. <clears throat> professor Mayall, um, as well as all that, has been the author of uh, a number of books and um, uh, theoretical and contextual perspectives uh, on illustration, 2007 to 2017. Uh, he, he, the, the, the celebrated book in 2014, Meeting the Brief, and The Power of Influence, um, sorry, The Power and Influence of Illustration, which was published in 2019, which is a highly recommended text and is is published worldwide and used throughout the world and has some excellent chapters, uh, particularly one by me. Um, Alan is the editor of, of a comparison of theoretical illustration, benchmark volume. Um, uh, Alan is also uh, an inquisitive person who I think it really his love of learning has allowed him to contribute to over 170 books and other publications. He has won numerous awards, including gold from the Society of Illustrators in Los Angeles. These are absolutely outstanding awards. And the Texas Blue Bonnet for uh, children's books. Um, he has exhibited internationally. He has really plowed the, the entire breadth of the creative industries uh, and will lead now this uh, Q&A and, and encourage people to, to join in with Stuart now. So ladies and gentlemen, uh, fellow uh, illustrators and non-illustrators, I give you the wonderful Alan Mayle. Uh, <clears throat> thanks, Mario. Thank you very much for that. Was that really all me? Well, anyway. Um, so I'm going to move on to uh, Stuart. Stuart, are you there? I'm here, Alan. Yeah. How are you going? You're there. Yeah, right. well done. Well, anyway, thank you um, for that incredibly incisive and interesting keynote. And um, I'm sure that we can extrapolate a considerable amount of material to discuss. Um, but uh, the first thing that I, I want to cover with you, actually, if, that, if that's okay, 
Um, you were talking about the lament of art and design schools uh, in art and design schools and um, the design industry um, of the fact about the fact that um, you know they don't think that there's anywhere near enough drawing being taught yes. um, and I just in a general sort of sense because I'd like I like this discussion to sort of broaden out if you like in a way you know and just to just briefly talk about the provision afforded by institutions for the teaching of drawings generally uh, now there may be some sort of difference between what it is here in the UK and 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 Australia I'm I, I'm I'm become I've become quite familiar with how it is in Australia obviously being a conjoint professor at Newcastle yeah. uh, but I think there are some similarities but I think that what we need to do though is just just look a little bit back at the, the at, at history because if we went back to the 60s and then prior to that I don't think anybody would have complained about um you know the actual provision that art schools provided for for drawing practice you know <clears throat> and this just goes to show how old I am I went to art school in the late 60s right and in the UK we used to have what we called municipal art schools mm -hmm. I mean every and they they were discrete uh, sort of independent institutions that um, practically every town, city, county had, um, along with their teacher training colleges and technical schools. And of course, they were all born out of the arts and crafts movement. Um, but then in the 70s and 80s in the UK, we had um, the, uh, you know, the, the development an introduction of the polytechnics and the and the and the new university sector, who then actually took over the yeah. or uh, you know they, they the 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 art schools themselves became just mere departments within these larger institutions. Um, yeah. But what we've what we've noticed is to a large extent is that the senior management in in these institutions um, they don't seem to have any the sort of respect that one would it would would expect from people that are running those places and and it seems as if we're fighting a losing battle i mean how, how do you how do you feel about that i mean and and sort of in an in an anecdotal sense what's it like at edith cowan yeah it's it's okay in my school because the head of our school, which is the biggest school in the university, is from the Chelsea School of Art. He oh, went through with um, Eduardo Palazzi, um, and he's got a, a sculpture and uh, printmaking background. So he fights the good fight on our behalf, which is nice. And so we can get away with, for example, having a dedicated drawing unit in first year for the visual arts majors and I can also have one for the design majors and students can do both if they so desire and I've worked closely with the the scholar that runs the visual arts drawing course to make sure we're not overlapping too much um, so that's that's good <clears throat> um, I'm not sure if it's quite so good at some of the other institutions in this town, there's five universities in Perth. Uh, we're quite over-serviced in many ways with universities. Um, and I, as I tell my colleagues, when things get bad in uh, Edith Cowan, you know they've already been bad in all the other institutions because we are yeah. we're small beer all round. So we we tend to go under the radar of lots of um, uh, you know big national decisions about um, staffing and, and um, budgets and so forth. Uh, so when things get bad with us, you know, they're worse elsewhere. So uh, be because we don't have as, ma as many, we don't have as much skin in the game for international students, for example. No. So, you know, with the COVID thing, that's really hit some of the other universities in town super heavily. And we we got off relatively scot free. And years ago, during the um, uh, the global financial crisis, which was just before my time in academia, I know that uh, Edith Cowan 
also were not the kind of university to gamble half of their earnings on the money market. So they got off lightly as well. So they they have a slightly less economically rationalist mindset at, in the yeah. than other universities, I think. Yeah, um, I'm yeah. Well, here in the UK. We we have been used over the used to over the past few years in, in a massive increase in, in in our student numbers. We've had to recruit considerably far more than than, than we did, you know, just 10, 15 years ago. And as far as teaching, you know, a, a practical um, a sort of discipline like like drawing. Uh, for example, that that's that's impacted quite a lot on on the, the pedagogical aspects of how we sort of deliver, you know, the old sitting with Nelly sort of um, way of teaching, particularly drawing and illustration and so on, it has has now has now gone, and so we, we've had to think very very carefully about how we sort of deliver, mm. and uh, and in a meaningful sort of way, um, you know. If you're confronted with with a cohort of 120 students, and it's in, in it's in the syllabus, for example, that they have to be taught drawing, it, it just even if it's just one day a week, how is that sort of how does one sort of facilitate that? And um, you know, I mean, how many numbers do you have to deal with? And and yeah, exactly. This this is one of the things we are fighting for constantly. I guess is that. Uh, maintaining studio space with, uh, you know, less than 25 students in it, in the studio, yeah. um, because the, the big shift in the last few years has been to have massive cohorts in the first year units. So what they're trying yeah. to do is kind of internationalise the first year course. And that um, online discussion I mentioned with my colleague in the English department, that was part of that, that course and the intention for running that course this year was they were going to have between 180 and 300 people in a room for every class. And of course it was going to be run in a lecture theater and they were going to run the lectures for two hours. Right. And of course the, the instruction from the teaching and learning gurus was, well, you have to make it interactive as if the architecture right. had no bearing on whether you could be interactive in that space, you know, that's designed yeah. to direct the gaze of everybody at this one individual down the front. So, of course, uh, the plan came quickly unstuck because we had to go online uh, because of COVID. And uh, so now we, we have these uh, shorter lectures and um, they're not interactive, but this is what uh, my colleague Deborah Dudek and myself have tried to do is kind of have these conversations as our lecture spots where we can talk about what we have in common around things like uh, storytelling. Um, yeah. But, but yeah, it's, it's not ideal. And so it's only really from second year onwards that students can really dedicate themselves in a studio space. Um, and so I think you, you miss some of it. And, and at the same time, we're getting pinged for like high attrition rates. You know, why are you losing students in first year? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Your course yeah. is fault. <laughs> so, well, they don't get a chance to do the thing they signed up for until the second year. No, no. Um, yeah, just just moving moving on a little bit. Uh, you talked a lot about um, the service industries, and you know that's that's you know a, a principal focus of your interest. Yeah. With, with with developing the comics and, and and the narrative sort of forms of illustration that that you're you're what you're working with. Um, and also, I've noticed that you, you've quoted before, you know, that that nowadays the, the sort of the economic basis of, of Western industrial nations, um, you know, it, it actually comprises 60 to 70 percent of, of, of service industries. And of course, we all know that that the creative industries and the communications industries are now really huge and, and yeah. impact a, a great deal on um you know, on 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 the, the, the economies of, of various countries around the world, particularly in 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 the, in the Western world, as as we sort of know it. But because of the global nature of what we do, and and I noticed that the work that you were showing was 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 principally 
uh, sort of couched in a, in Western and Australia, if if you like, which which, which is fine. And I was going to yeah. ask if 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 any of your work or or any of your students think in a in a more global sort of way. Uh, but but if they do, you know, we have to be mindful of an increasing awareness, you know, um, required for sort of global societal societal and and cultural sort of differences does that come to play with with you and 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 have had you have you had to think a lot about that when you're when you're teaching and 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 the way in which you you grow and develop your curriculum yeah definitely i think at the change in our curriculum was really based on having access to the design institute of australia's practice notes and what yeah. they were telling us was that design institutions were producing five times more graduates than there were kind of traditional studio positions. I don't think yeah. the DIA, you know, really has a, a great handle on what's going on in terms of in-house designers or or freelancing and so forth. I mean, how can they? It's a very difficult question to get your head around. Um, but because those opportunities weren't really there for the number of graduates we were producing, we were trying to work more to create students that could work with local councils, with um, NGOs, etc. Work, at, you know, to help them kind of solve problems. And one of the things we thought of with this, the kind of classic studio position, uh, is that they would be competing on a global stage. So, if, so if clients were looking for these discrete problem solving. Uh, students they'd be you know they'd be looking all over the world if you know that you need a poster that's the answer to your communication problem why pay a fortune locally when you can get it done overseas for next to nothing so we were trying to produce students that could work on more complex problems uh, because we figured that those are, are kind of too difficult to do long distance and you need kind of local interaction if you've got to work with, um, you know, 20 people involved on this problem, you need to be on the ground with those people. And so that's, yeah. that's really been the focus is trying to create students that work locally uh, or have a local mindset. And if they want to work uh, locally overseas, hopefully we're still giving them the skills to do that. Um, yeah. But we, we're not really trying to produce students that are, are knocking off a $10 logo or uh, or music packaging design, like I do, <laughs> for international <laughs> clients, but no matter. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. The, the 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 other thing too that I've noticed that, that you that you've said that, um, and I'm assuming that this is part of your 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 sort of experience that, that students have been directed away from the humanities. Sorry, um, say again. Uh, that, that students have been directed away from the humanities yeah um can you expand expand a little bit more on that because i because it's, it's interesting because you you know some of what you were talking about earlier you you were you seem to be integrating quite a lot with 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 other with other disciplines with, with, even within your university i mean you said that a close yeah. friend of yours an associate was 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 an english teacher yeah and i can't remember and lawyers and various other things so if yep. your students are, are engaging in this sort of way then then one would assume that they're going to become very knowledgeable of those subjects and those, of those disciplines and have a lot of insight into it so that, that so you could say that they're starting to become more sort of polymathic in the way in which they think and the way in which they that they approach definitely um, yeah. But but you know I, I'm I'm just a little bit confused about about this business with, with with the humanities because you know like like at Falmouth where I which is my institution we we integrate um, you know liberal studies and contextual studies very much with 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 illustration practice yeah and 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 very much part and parcel of what we do is to, is to ensure that the students not only can communicate verbally but that they do so in writing and i mean is that something that you that you that you encourage yeah absolutely yeah 
um, this is part of the idea that uh, Deborah and English and myself had is that everybody should draw and everybody should write. And, um, and this has been, you know, I, th I think when I was talking about that narrative turn and visual turn at the start of my yes. talk, I had in mind um, that kind of st string of theories that once upon a time were thought to belong to, um, you know, acts of speech or of writing, such as rhetoric or, yeah. or metaphor. And, of course, now we know through the work of Lakoff and Johnson or through... Um, you know, Richard Buchanan in design and Guy Bonsiep and the, and the Swiss design network that rhetoric is, is just a, a function of mind like narrative is and it can be yeah, absolutely. expressed in any, any medium. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, I, I think the thing that was uh, on my mind when I, was, when I was talking to you earlier was that idea that um, well, our, our Australian government policy anyway at the moment seems to be aimed at trying to direct students away from the humanities. Um, yeah. and, and making the courses more expensive, which, yes. of course, you know, perversely makes them more attractive to the universities to run them. <laughs> well, of course. Yeah, well, it, well, it would but, but I was reading, I was reading about um, Agassiz, uh, the American naturalist. I think you're probably familiar with his yeah, work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, uh, and some of his writings from the middle of the 19th century where he was complaining that there wasn't enough studio time and students were being discouraged from drawing and science, the sciences weren't being taken seriously in the academy. Oh, right. And I thought, yes. oh, this all sounds painfully familiar. So it's, it's, it's incredible, <laughs> yes. isn't it? That, that STEM it is. back then wasn't, well, at least the science side of it wasn't, wasn't taken seriously. It was too, too practical a subject, perhaps. Yes. Mm. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And not, and maybe not seen as intellectually um, That's right. too, sound enough. Exactly. Too much learning through doing. Yeah. But, but stay, staying with the, um, the, the, the drawing and, um, and, and the writing, the, the, you know, the, the, the literary aspect of this, it's interesting to, to sort of to note that, uh, and this, this is particularly prevalent in the, in the UK, that, that in publishing, about 50% now of children's picture books and chapter books are actually written and illustrated by the same person, and wow. and 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 that publishers actually encourage that, you know, because they feel that you know they're just obviously they're dealing with one person, and 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 it's a, and it's the complete package, yeah. And it's something that I mean, about fifteen years ago, I introduced creative writing onto my illustration course, and. Mm. And it and the and and the and the two ran very very uh, closely together, uh, you know, and 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 and, mm. and 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 the writing side impacted very much on on the on the illustration side. Um, Absolutely. I mean, I mean, and with with your comic book work, do you do you sort of encourage that sort of approach, almost like a yeah, we you know, have, like we have... graphic noveling and so on. Yeah, we have a an artist's book um, project that we do with the the head of visual arts, myself as the head of design, and um, one of the writers from the creative writing course. All three of us get together, and we give um, kind of weird takes on the same prompt to the students, and then they they go away and work on artist books. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. So bringing poetry into the visual realm and and responding to words visually or responding visually to the words. Um, yeah. But, but also, you know, thinking about the tactile aspect of, of the materials they're working with. And as I, yeah. as I was alluding to in the talk, um, thinking about this, um, the kind of affordances of, of material objects to reveal the narrative as you go through and to kind of suspend uh, you know, create suspense through physical um, materials. You know, you 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 know you 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 emphasise you know your 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 push and and the way in which you're developing uh, the narrative aspect of of, of drawing and and illustration. Um, you know what what might this change about the way drawing is is taught, or or don't you think it will be? Well, I think 
you know, there's there's still value in the observational, but maybe yes. tr maybe traditionally there's for my from my way of thinking, there's been maybe too much value placed on observation. Um, and and uh, you know, as as Mario was talking about before, the imagination. We you know, yes. as as kind of um, creative industries, creative people, creative scholars, we're very interested in the inside world, the interior world. Yes. And to me, illustration always, even at the most mundane level, always has this metaphoric attribute. So if, if a metaphor is there to make the ungraspable into a concrete, yeah. knowable thing, that's the role yeah. in, in my mind. That's the key role for drawing is to, is to bring out something, that, an idea, and to make it yeah. physical on the page. So, so that's... And I think that's the thing that changes through narrative drawing is is an emphasis on that idea and an emphasis on explaining that idea through a story. So therefore, each drawing becomes kind of less important, but more kind of, um, you know, like bricks in a, in a wall, if you like, rather than focusing on the individual yeah. brick. Yeah, um, it, it, it's also interesting that a lot of the work that you that you showed um the it was very representational and and in a sense quite quite traditional in in a in a sort of a, a graphic novel narrative sort of comic book sort, sort of style if you like yeah. um and it, it's interesting that a lot of applicants to the uk undergraduate illustration programs this is across the whole country very often only see illustration itself in, in, in terms of graphic noveling. Mm. Now, I don't know if that's something that, that, you've, that you've come across um, and don't seem to be familiar with, with any other forms of, 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 of illustration, what, whatever that, that, that might be. Um, but I mean, there's a paradox here for me because, you know, in order to do to, to do graphic novels or even some of the the sort of work that, that you're advocating and that and that you're producing with, with, with yourself or with your students, you know, you have to draw superbly well, you know, in, in, in terms of, you know, putting together dramatic compositions and visual interactions and, you know, human gesture and expression and, and, and so on. And a lot of that is born out of pure observation, um, you know, which is which I have to actually say. But that doesn't necessarily mean that you have to approach it in a subjective manner. You know, I mean, like the old, like if we went back to the days of Leonardo, when we were looking at just just it's very ontological in the way in which they approach their work. You know, what you saw was what what was it? Yeah. You know, you didn't you didn't need to think or analyze anything more than what what it what it than what it was the morphological aspects of, of, the, of, of, of the subject but so when it comes to teaching students today in the it, you know to to it, you know you're encouraging them to develop the narrative ways in which that, that you that you want them to go in do you not feel that perhaps um you know students should be actually drawing in more in that sort of traditional sort of uh, objective sort of way. I, I think there's, there's definitely something to be had um, in, in a focus on that, at least at the beginning, as you say, yeah. for, you know, observational purposes in order to then be able to boil that down to the, to the essence of, you know, cartooning, which still contains all these kind of very realistic gestures and so forth. Yes. But, the problem becomes kind of equating visual realism with truth or with truthiness. Yes. Um, when something that's completely abstract that you can draw, you can make visible on the page, let's say like a, a family tree diagram or, yes. or, a, or a corporate structure diagram. Now you made yes. that thing visible. You can't go out in the world and draw that. You can't draw that no. as, a, you know, as a kind of copy, copy off what you see. And it's and it's and it's important and it's and it's truthful, um, and you make it visual through this kind of uh, metaphoric process, um, and that's not about observation of what's outside. It's about observing 
thoughts and knowledge inside somehow and making them making a connection to something that maybe you've seen in the real world i don't know but yeah yeah but i i've always said and i've you know i've actually written about this that with um you know the aspects of 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 um objective and analytical drawing there, there, there are there are three ways in which you can go there is the ontological truth sort of um approach but and, and you've just described what what i've talked about before is is the phenomenological truths you know you're talking about processes and um phenomena that we know exist right but they're abstract sort yep. of notions we can't see them like the theory of evolution for example yeah um photosynthesis you know from a scientific point of view um but there's also another one as well and and now we're getting more into the realms of of sort of religion mythology and culture and that's fantasy mm. where perhaps um you know people uh, will sort of deflect away from pure ontological sort of work because of some sort of uh, cultural diktat or some religious belief that they feel that they have to represent something more in that sort of field because they don't because of censorship or because of, of, of various other things that, that, would, that, would, that would, would, where they would be castigated for actually producing that sort of work. It, it is, it, it's actually, it, it leads us into some very interesting areas. I the, think. the veiled critique. The veiled critique, yes. Yeah, yeah but, but very much so. Um, so it's very um, interesting that you raise actually the, the fantasy thing. And, and I think yes. the same holds true for science fiction as well. Something that doesn't oh, exist. Yes. But both of those those uh, registers, if you like, those modes can perversely benefit from a very realistic kind of rendering, can't they? Oh, oh absolutely. In order to uh, you know, suspend I mean, I think, the audience. Or... I think you can produce a, an illustration or an image in a very um, representational and, as you say, a realistic sort of way, but it can be unbelievably creative. Yeah. You know, for me, it's what you do and say with the image. Yeah. You know, and that's where the imagination sort of comes from it. And 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 to me, I think drawing is 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 the way in which a lot of that that process of thinking can be externalized and and then sort of developed. Yeah. Um, and I also think that, like, sort of taking inspiration and developing developing that into some sort of creative idea isn't something that can be done by rote you know you can't sort of teach it in and say well you've got to start looking at that bit and then moving on to here yeah. it has to it ha has to be much more spontaneous and and so on do you agree with that yeah absolutely um just to return to Agassi, it was quite interesting to look at his um, classroom prompts and how oh, yeah. light they were on detail. And, yes. uh, and, you know, the students that came up through that course were, you know, would often complain about having almost no instruction, but they found themselves, you know, just having to figure it out and, and kind of growing this extra brainal node just to deal with observation. Yeah, yeah, I know. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I mean, I always used to say to the students that that sort of drawing, in a sense, was like a process of search and change. Yeah, because um, you know, and it's always best when it's free. You know, when 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 you're doing the drawing, that you're sort of free from that, from the sort of the formality or constraints of 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 having to um, use preconceived media or some expected visual language which 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 you're trying to push or you know just to allow the whole thing to develop sort of naturally and see where you see where you sort, sort of go and I, I i always think that's a very good way to sort of to sort of proceed yeah. but my but i've always been more concerned with content and and what the illustration is doing and saying rather than to obsess over media and the um, the visual language itself um, mm. to me that should just, just just should just come naturally anyway I mean uh, I don't know how you feel about that 
I mean, if, let, let, let's say, for example, if you had a student, because most of the most of the work that you showed, there was there was quite a uh, a defined sort of style f flowing through most of it. Perhaps yeah, well, most of, most of that say. was in that kind of um, narrative uh, mode for service design. Um, yes. So it was a little bit samey. I, I think it was just trying to amplify that idea of making multiple pictures uh, with kind of relatively low stakes. But I think right. to go back to what you were saying about representation of, you know, things out there versus um, making visible things in here, yeah. uh, that's definitely a big part of it for, for, for us, for the students, um, is to discover how they each draw yeah. and how, how it feels to make marks for them and how you kind of start to develop a style of, of picturing that's your own. And to me, that's completely tied in with what media you gravitate towards. Yes. Uh, you know, the, the rough feel of a pencil on, on toothy paper uh, versus, you know, smooth gliding of a brush on, on, on you know, a uh, hammer mill or something with ink. Totally well, it's, about it's, the same same process. The way you make the marks and the the media you uh, gravitate towards, I think, should come naturally with practice. Yeah, yeah. I suppose in a sense, I know that one of the um, later on um, in this in this uh, symposium, uh, one, one of the one of the breakout groups is going to be talking about, you know, uh, traditional ways of working versus. Um, the new technologies and, and, and the digital sort of aspects of producing work. I mean, you've just alluded to very much that sort of the, the physical tangency that we have with, with real media and and yeah. so on. The the the, um, the sensuality of it, I suppose, to a, to a certain extent. Um, well, where where do you sort of stand on that that particular sort of? Yeah, I, I, I definitely, I, I was a person that was um, a, a latecomer to design. And by the time I studied it, the digital tools had been introduced. And so I, my first couple of graphic design jobs were physical paste up jobs. Oh, only, right, yeah. Only for the first couple of months. And then I, I embraced the digital tools with gusto. And it's only over years that I've kind of worked my way back to um being an old curmudgeon and really enjoying the, the physical stuff. Um, yeah. But I'm, I'm really fried today because we had a, a huge day yesterday in the, in the print room with the, with the design students, the design first years. And for most of them, um, it was their first time getting ink under their nails and, and making mono prints. And they had a ball. We couldn't get them out of the room. I bet. So, so it was almost like, to them, this old media is is new media. You know, it's it's like uh, yeah. it's like having a, a um, fixie bicycle or you know homemade pie or something. It's it's yeah. it feels authentic to them. I think as an as an experience. So I, I hold out a lot of hope that they will kind of embrace that and, and go back there to to use it. Yeah. Um, I think it's important. Do you, yeah, just just moving into a slightly different area now. Um, you, you talk about narrative, and I mean, you you see that uh, as as being you know very much part of, uh, of illustration in in in, in, a, in a big way. Um, and I always see narrative as as a sort of um, when we're talking about sequ sequential work or you know, where it's dealing with a chronology of some sort or other. Um, but, you know, for me, there are five contexts of illustration practice fundamentally. Um, and I think that you can apply narrative to all five mm. in a visual sense, even to, you know, even an advertising campaign. Yeah. Um, tells a story, doesn't it, very often. It, it's, it, it's a narrative and, it, and it's sequential. Um, and most sort of um, aspects of information illustration or, or that, the, those, the, those images that actually convey knowledge or educate us in some sort of way, a lot of that is very, very narrative in, in the way in which it's, it's sort of produced. The, the non-fiction side of yeah. things. 
because a lot of people seem to think that narrative illustrations is purely fictional stuff. Yeah. But, but I, I see I see it as going across all, all, all five of those contexts, you know, which is like editorial information, um, advertising, um, and then you have the uh, packaging uh, and, uh, and and marketing uh, side of work. Yes. Uh, so, so and and, I, and you can apply it to all of them. Um, but it, by saying that, do you encourage broader contexts of practice to come into into your line of work and where in, into your teaching? You know, do you do you do you touch on advertising? Do you touch on sort of um, knowledge based material or or yeah, what? yeah, absolutely. Um, so my other uh, hat when I'm not working in the academy is uh, I run a record label with uh, with a couple, oh, right. of, okay. couple of friends, yeah. and yeah. Uh, we we make a living for one of one of our partners and also for a lot of our artists through licensing, basically. Yeah. So we we sell a lot of um, music for uh, sell licenses for music to advertising. Yeah, and to uh, documentary making and so forth. Um, so uh, there's a there's a focus on that, and quite often we get students involved in some of those projects as well. So the idea of yeah. um, an advertising campaign being being a narrative and going across media is is definitely uh, you know front of mind when we're kind of setting those those uh, projects up for them. Um, I think like to get back to the materials discussion. I think that comes into it as well. So you mentioned packaging design. Yeah. That could totally be a narrative experience, you know, that, that difference between what you see on the front of the package yes. and what happens when you open it up, you know, how does it change? Yeah. How does it, you know, support your uh, expectations or, or subvert them in a, in a surprising and exciting way? So yeah. like that kind of lovely gameplay that um, you learn through, uh, the students learn through making with materials how to control, I think, the material experience of the of the customer of that product or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. And it could be you, like, you know, really like a micro narrative, really, but but still a narrative nonetheless. It's it's a it's a kind of a time-based experience where something something changes, a tiny little story is told, fiction or non-fiction. Do you, you place a lot of emphasis on, you know, when you're teaching and when students are engaged with with, with project work? Um, you know, you, you know whether they're working on a brief, whatever that might be. Uh, do, you, do you place a lot of emphasis on making sure that they understand who the target audience is, and and uh, are they taught about that? Is is, that, is there some sort of integrated part of the of your of your teaching which which looks at lots of different types of audiences? You know, from narrow focused audiences to to a broad global audience for example is that because that covered yeah absolutely think, yeah. Um, and and do you and do you think that the way in which we draw can affect that you know i mean for example yeah. if, if 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 you're producing something some visual imagery for that that's that's for somebody to say that's going to be marketed worldwide mm. would would that um uh impact very much on on how your students approach the, the, the work or 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 what yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, we were involved with a uh, research project with um, David Skopek at the UDK in Berlin oh, to yes. uh, try and reimagine um, the toilet pictograms for different cultures, oh, for right. example. Yes. So yes, very, yes. very focused and, you know, kind of seemingly simple, uh, discrete little task to redesign these things, but with, you know, incredible um, implications. Um so, yeah, we, we look at that on one side, but, you know, these, these um, first year courses, I was explaining that everybody in the school has to do, regardless of whether they're doing journalism or English or, yeah, yeah, yeah. or politics or whatever. Um, they have a focus in there about, you know, writing for particular audiences, communicating visually to particular audiences. And then we'll, we'll pick up that thread when the students come to us for, for their major. Yeah. But we also want to open it up to the idea of like, who who are you as as an illustrator, as a as a drafts person, as a designer? Are you a neutral conduit for your client's message, 
and yeah. and you can tell them what's appropriate for that audience or whatever, or you can discuss that together. Or are you a part author or the entire author of that message? You know, in which case, what kind of license does that open up to you to just kind of communicate what you feel and and to let people embrace it or not? You know, on your terms. So all all kind of points in between those. We have, it, we have a unit called what is designed for question um, mark, which kind of opens up all these things and opens up that question of having a personal philosophy about what you think uh, visual communication is for. And, and is there, uh, do you have a defined answer that you expect them to, to come up with? Or, <laughs> no, or is it, it, or is it not. open-ended? <clears throat> <laughs> certainly not. <clears throat> it, 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 so it's open-ended. Yeah, in the same way that I wouldn't tell them how to draw, I want them to discover who they are. Yeah, um, we'll give them, you know, some strategies to maybe go and explore in different directions. And I think yeah. that's that's the same. Yeah, you, you can't. I, I would hate to think you would tell somebody what philosophy they should adopt. <laughs> so, and and do you, and you do you encourage that that sort of authorial approach to illustration, where you know the the illustrator um has creative ownership and control over what it is that they actually do without being too prescribed in any sort of given way well I certainly encourage them to look at it but I, yeah. I know that you know three quarters of our students are absolutely horrified by the idea of of inventing a narrative themselves or inventing are they problem they would much rather have the rules of the game laid out and to to play you know be playful within those parameters that's that seems to be um the majority of our students others embrace it with gusto but most would like to be given the um the strict parameters of this particular brief and work within it they freak out a bit if they if they if they don't have the the boundaries uh are they do they but the sort of work that they actually produce at the end does it does it look or 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 have they you know the sort of methods that they use to, to produce that work um has it restricted them do you think very much i mean are they really sort of in terms of what's going on in their head contained within a, 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 a sort of a box and what is it that they're afraid to get out of i think they <clears throat> it's not they're not so much afraid to explore, but they want to have a starting point. I think they, right. they don't want to be dropped in the middle of the ocean. They'd rather be, you know, to, to use a kind of a Dungeons and Dragons kind of uh, analogy, like you, you awaken in a, in a dark dungeon and at least they know where they are. Then, you know, they get a sense of <laughs> they need yeah, to get out or something. Whereas, yes. you know, they're not just wandering in a desert of, of uh, you know, lack of ideas or prompts. Um, but the, the work that comes out is, you know, substantially different from student to student, noticeably different, which is always gratifying. Yeah, I mean, do, you, do your students uh, engage in a lot of um, location work, reportage and so on? And, and, if, and if they do, I mean, are they encouraged to be expressive with that sort of work or to be much more sort of descriptive? Yeah, well, not reportage per se, but we encourage them when we're working on projects with clients that they're recording the discussions visually and so they can right. use direct references from that, um, those meetings in the yes. final design and especially around um, service design there's you know for our students we do a lot of work in that area and <clears throat> the first run of it will be at this very chicken scratchy kind of level yeah. um, on the one hand because it's a function of working very quickly to to record what's being said and and the gestures and so forth uh, but on the other hand it's it's at that level so that when we present the ideas back to the client and back to the client's um, customers or whatever, uh, client's clients, in, in the case of um, 
somebody like Anglicare or, you know, Centre for Social Impact, you want to encourage that um, interaction from their users. And if the thing looks, you know, too stylized or too pushed in one direction or too slick, then uh, quite often the response will be, oh, it's great. Yeah. And that's, that's all you'll get from them. It's fine. No problem. Whereas if it's very sketchy and open, they'll, they'll buy into it and they'll, they'll add sketches to it and so on, which we encourage them to yes. do. And then yeah. as, as we proceed, depending on what, where that service gets to and what the client needs to do in terms to get the service funded and up and running, they might have to pre prepare it as kind of something that looks like a fait accompli to their um, bean counters in which case our students would then be encouraged to kind of, you know, stylize it and put their heart and soul into, into the finished um, narrative, visual narrative. Yeah. Do you find that a lot of students, particularly at undergraduate level, though, um, are, you know, quite influenced by certain sort of styles of, of, of illustration or, or certain contexts of practice. I'm, I'm thinking uh, in terms of things like sort of manga, which, yeah. which, which has been, you know, I, I, I believe it still is very popular. Um, you know, it has been in, in the UK, for example, you know, you, you, you know, you, that, you interview prospective students and some of them would have portfolios full of sort of uh, manga drawings. Uh, not very yeah. good, I, I, yeah. I have to say. <laughs> yes. um, you know, well, um, but I mean, I don't know um, what your view is on, on that. Um, I'm going to say here, like I, I would definitely see that maybe 10 years ago. And I think we've had a, a really wonderful and rich explosion in... in um, even a splintering, if you like, of, of illustration styles. Illustration was not a, not a big deal here until no. the early 2000s. And then suddenly you started to see it in all, all the latest magazines. Yes. And, um, of course, early on it had a very, you know, flash website kind of look to it, very vector graphics. Yes. It wasn't long yeah. before people were getting back into that kind of handmade style. And I think yeah. now, like, like musical tastes, it's so splintered. Um, you yeah. occasionally you get, you know, the kind of adventure time, the, the Pendleton Ward kind of aesthetic, but mostly it's, it's there's quite a variety there, I think. Um, yeah. This, this is one of the things that I, I found interesting reading um, Neil Cohn's work about, you know, the grammar of comics and so on. And he, he actually laments that we don't have a visual, a strong visual vocabulary, vocabulary like the Japanese do. Um, in, in the West. And I was thinking, well, I, th I think that's a great thing that we don't. I think it's great that we have this kind of variety of expression that people are, yeah. uh, you know, bringing forth their, their body felt kind of uh, yes. responses to what, yeah. what they feel and know about the world when they draw rather than an accepted kind of off the rack approach. Maybe I don't have the eyes to see the subtle differences within manga oh. there's probably a lot more there than i've than i've given it uh, credit for um can i sort of up the ante a little bit now and just move move up a gear from say uh because we've talked a lot about undergraduate uh you know the undergraduate student experience which is which is to be expected because that's where the majority of the teaching lies because at the end of the day this is about drawing in the academy so you would expect yeah. that um but um, if, if we can just talk briefly, I don't know how much longer we've got, but if we can just talk briefly a little bit about research mm. and where drawing sort of lies with that. Um, you know, I mean, I don't know what your view is when you peer review sort of uh, research papers that are, you know, ostensibly to do with drawing or uh, vi visual sort of work. Um, how much do you think that, that, that those papers or that research is, is uh, where, where the visual work you see is research led 
or, or whether or not you're, you're just looking at something where, where which is just research informed. So it's 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 a more yeah. superficial sort of approach to 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 uh, to using it. Well, what do you think, think about that? Yeah, I think it's a really good question. I think it's noticeable, definitely. I think there are a lot of scholars out there that uh, are reporting on what they see. For example, on um, a, a scholarly review of a graphic novel, of an important yeah. graphic novel, for example, um, that the artist chose to work in this way, um, in this size book for these reasons and you think well actually there are a whole bunch of constraints probably from the publisher that you don't know about because you don't yeah, work yeah, as yeah, an yeah. illustrator there's yeah. the the physical constraints of the artist's own musculature you know that they're not referring yeah. to as if this artist has just adopted that style just to tell that story it may it may be that the story and the style coincide in really nice harmonious ways and that's why this is such a successful book but that artist is going to work in that way, you know, and, and I read a lot of scholarly work at that level where, where they're observing it as if these are uh, very careful and deliberate choices that maybe they're not, or maybe they were out of the control of, of the author. And I think yeah. it, it would be really nice, like I mentioned before, that kind of conversation that um, my English colleague and I have in front of the undergraduate students, it would be nice to see a lot more scholarship between, let's say, narratologists and makers. Yes. Uh, in Australia, I don't know if you have this problem in England, but, you know, our, our creative outputs as research are always called non-traditional research outputs. Yes. You know, as if they're yeah. kind of, there's the proper ones and then there's these non-traditional ones. Yeah, I know, Maybe a I way know. to get around that would be for us makers to work um, a bit more closely with with writers and then we could pull them up on these, these points points of order and say well actually the yeah. reason it looks like that is because whatever well i mean i i have to say as as an anecdote and as an aside um i mean you're talking about working with with you know your, your colleague was english but um i mean when i did my phd all those years ago and i i first embarked on on research in the, in the in the context that we're talking about now i work with scientists mm. and and that that was an interesting experience i can tell you because i remember we i remember the first time that i i um uh part wrote in conjunction with with these scientists well it was a it was a joint paper it was three of us two scientists uh, and me but i but i was seen as an equal anyway and, and, and participated but when we went to the conference and we had to present ourselves and you can imagine what what some of these scientists particularly from the united states were like i mean they you know they don't uh, you know they don't hold any punches you know they 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 they, they go straight for the jugular as, as you can pro probably probably imagine and they say things like uh, well why have you done it that color yeah you know and and then you suddenly think to yourself, now why did I do it? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> and it's, yeah. Uh, it's it's a, it is it's a, it's an interesting concept, isn't it? This and um, but I, but, versus explicit oh, knowledge. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. But do you think that uh, that drawing can manifest purely as research? Yeah, I'm, I have no no doubt. I think um, as I was saying in the talk, I think. It hasn't helped growing up in an Anglophone culture where, you know, words are held in this regard and pictures are down here. And yes. have all these assumptions about what each is good for. Um, I think there, there are endless possibilities that we haven't even explored yet. I, I, I you know, I, I imagine a, a day where there's a, a purely visual PhD, and I'm not talking about like uh, Nick Susanis's unflattening, which always gets brought up at these points. But like yeah, yeah. strictly pictorial, I, I don't see why that's not a possibility. It's a pretty outlandish one, but I think it, it could be feasible. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right. Well, I must confess, I don't have any more sort of uh, hard questions. <laughs> uh, <laughs> can I, but can that's I ask been you one. Alan? That's been great. Yes, please do. Yeah. About the, the working with the scientists, because I'm sure it's something you told me years ago, 
uh, I'm not even sure how to phrase this, but it was something about how when you're drawing, let's say, a species of fish. Yes. That you're not drawing necessarily the one that's sitting in front of you. You're trying to draw the quintessential yellowfin tuna, for example. <laughs> so I just wonder, is, is that correct? And, and is, how do you go about trying to make an amalgam of all the yellowfin tuna you've ever met? Uh, that's and how, how does that sit with like you know pure representation versus something else something you know about a species or, or whatever is that is well that I think uh, no it no is a, a very good question actually and I, I think the 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 answer I would give is it depends very much on what the requirement is and why you're actually doing it yeah I mean if you, you you're talking about a yellow fin tuna well if it's just a general sort of illustration of a yellowfin tuna, there's a chance that it's going to be on a page in a book or, you know, it, it's going to appear on a website or whatever with, with other species within the same family. So yeah. you're producing an illustration which is sort of generic to that particular right. species and, and it's going to be shown in a, in, a, in a classic sort of pose, usually side on so you can see the shape of the fins. It's just it's purely for identity. Yeah. Salient view purely for identification purposes, yeah. but then there are. But then there's the other side, which the more sensory sort of side, uh, if you like, where you you might be um, illustrating a particular sort of specimen or 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 or, or um, a sort of um, where where a species has, has sort of gone off on its own and and developed quirky ways different right. from others of its own kind, and so you're you're doing your best there to to sort of get into this thing and 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 actually bring out its characterizations and 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 and, and that particular quirkiness. So right. there are, there are lots of different ways in which which you can you can show this. And uh, and then of course I mentioned earlier on about the phenomena. It could be the evolution of a species. How, yeah. how do you how how do you yeah. show that? Yeah. Well, well, then you're you're moving into the realms perhaps of diagrams and, and so on. Yeah. So it's so it's, it's it's a very broad field. You know yeah, I mean? very rich field. Yeah, and a very rich field. Yes. Yeah. Right. Thanks, Alan. That's all right. I think we have some questions. I believe Ari, are you there? Oh, maybe not. <laughs> okay, so I'm, oh, I'm, I'm just going to sort of faci help facilitate this next sort of little 15 to 20 minutes as we wrap up. And I just want to thank you both for the discussion. It's been really interesting and I guess really interesting to see some of the sort of um, synthesis of ideas from two, two different people. And I think resonating with other people about the things like manga and things like um, how drawing within the academy works both from a tertiary education point of view but also how it can manifest as research maybe solely as you were just discussing then. Um, I've got a couple of questions to ask both of you um, to pull it back into that education space as we move forward. So you know there's lots of research being done about about multiple creativities as we move forward, uh, thinking about how creativity in the, and the creative industries, but creativity works and operates in a range of different fields. And you can see now from the keynote, keynote from Stuart, how drawing is starting to almost move into these other areas like service design that are engaging with law, engaging with um, you know, other communities, perhaps in how we tell stories and visual storytelling works. But, um, the industry and business community and all parts of society need these sorts of skills as we and Australia is currently sitting at 23 on the world table of innovation. So how do we start to think about engaging these types of strategies and drawings with external communities to understand how creativity has value within the innovation conversation, which now has nearly been going on for, uh, you know, 20 years, as Stuart said, drawing become, and illustration becoming prominent here in Australia around about 2000. Um, and we've been having this conversation about creative industries itself. Um, but yeah, how is drawing still relevant in this innovation age and, 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 and moving away from the buzzword perhaps, but, but using it as a really um, strong conceptual strategy for ideas. I, I, I've always said that you can't teach creativity. I, I, I mean, I, I really don't 
think you can. You, 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 I mean, I, I hate to use this sort of this simplistic term, but we're, we're all born differently anyway, and we all have particular aptitudes and things that we're good at and not good at. Um, I think that really that good teaching, good pedagogy is, is being able to, to bring that creativity out, to enable the student to be able to harness that and then, um, you know, externalize that through drawings, if that's ha how it should be. And it doesn't matter what the style is, because as I was saying before, it's all down to what the, that, what the ideas are and, and where they're actually coming from. And then also, if it's if it's in a research context, then 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 to apply it to whatever your methodology is, and then then pursue that methodology in a creative way. Yeah, it, it's 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 not easy to explain really, and and particularly if you're looking at trying to sort of explain that to a lay audience, because most people they just think uh, when they when they hear the term creativity, they think oh that's somebody playing a guitar you know, or they're, they're being clever or, or, or whatever. Um, so, you know, I mean, that's that's where I'm coming it's, from with that. It's interesting you say that, and I'm going to quote one of, one of the organisers here, Dr Andrew Howes, where, he, where when we started our course on drawing this year, we said we can't teach you to draw. No. We can teach oh, you... No, that's right. yeah. We can teach you about drawing we can teach you about techniques we can teach you about processes but we can't yeah, yeah. teach you how to and it still involves that engagement with tacit knowledge as as Stuart was saying that sort of master yeah. learning the ways by doing and and the importance of that process which brings me to another question which I might direct towards Stuart and that is um what we see in, in many, and I'm sure it's similar in the UK and around the world, is we see drawing being so so used by children at a young age uh, and up until perhaps 12 or 13, um, and it sort of drops off within the curriculum. And then when we come to universities, uh, we are sort of acting as a bit of a remedial centre for that process of it being lost within mm -hmm. uh, secondary education, um, whatever you call that around the globe. Um, and and there's sort of this argument for drawing being the big draw, for example, that drawing being so important in, in perhaps those teen years and, and how it can be integrated within secondary curriculum so that by the time we, we're, we're arriving in higher education, doing all the sorts of pedagogical practices that we all know and love, um, should there be more of an emphasis of drawing within the secondary uh, do you think, or do you have any reflections on that, Stuart, and your own students that you've seen come through? For sure, I think uh, I mean, we're we're all biased, aren't we? Of course, but um, yeah, I think it should continue throughout. Uh, a lot of the literature seems to talk about this U-shaped curve. You know, where kids uh, when they're infants, they're just drawing, as you say, all the time, uh, and then it drops off. And again, maybe this is a function of being in an anglophone society. Uh, where we're, you know, we're weaned off picture books as we grow older. You know, the pictures start to evaporate from the books. Um, so it's not just about a uh, lack of encouragement to draw. It's about a lack of kind of uh, drawn input into your, into your kind of daily life, I think. So there's a whole bunch of things conspiring against that. Um, maybe it creates, uh, you know, good, good uh, critical readers. I don't know, but... Um, yeah, I think I think that skill should be kept there, and and maybe to tie that back to your question about creativity, uh, you know, it's it's such a strange term, but I, one of the things that I hear much more lately is this idea of capability, and I, I read a, a Deloitte's uh, report, as you do, which is pretty <laughs> riveting reading, uh, but it was about um, the Toyota plant in in um, uh, one of the cities in Japan. And they found that the guys running the robots on the floor couldn't keep up with the changes necessary in the programming and um, and the software changes, et cetera, the updates. And what Toyota decided to do was to get these guys um, working physically bending metal themselves using, you know, old, old style tools, um, old um, lathes and uh, uh, guillotines, et cetera, and they found that they built up these new capabilities and came up with much better ideas about how 
the robots could be doing this work and and it totally changed their relationship with with their daily work practices uh, and they seemed to become more creative and more invested in what they were doing so whether that's teaching them creativity or not i don't know but it, it seemed to be increasing their capabilities and i think what's so important about keeping kids drawing all the time is that that physicality. So it's not maybe not necessarily just about drawing, but maybe uh, the importance of play, physical play all the way through, right up into adulthood. Why not? Why aren't we still, you know, climbing on jungle gyms and climbing trees and so forth? Um, you know, if, if you think about drawing as this kind of metaphoric uh, way of kind of making your um, place in the world and your your relationship to it and your understanding of the relationship of things in the world making those concrete on the page then you need to be you know physically active in that world and I think drawing is, is a much more physical interactive activity than than uh, writing on a computer or, or reading yeah absolutely um also so another question we've, uh, I've got is um the rhetoric um, is a foundation of the mind, so to speak, when it comes to speculative thinking. So can we start to use visual rhetoric? And I suppose this plays into the idea of also learning the skills of visual thinking and how to think about composition, as Alan mentioned earlier, learning the technique. And we've got another question on that as well, that, you know, this idea of working conceptually versus having that skill. And that's a lot of the time where a lot of our students are sitting as they come into higher education, especially if we are a remedial um, sort of centre in some senses as well. Um, but how can we start to get them thinking as you've, uh, many of your case studies in the keynote uh, exemplified, the idea of using, um, you know, not making it a little too scary to draw these ideas and concepts um, to begin that process um, so that we can start to translate it into speculative thinking, perhaps um, using it as an ideation for one of another but does buzzword um, thinking. Is that, mm. Does that make sense? Yeah, I, I think so. I mean, is that is that a question around visual literacy maybe? Like yeah, well, so oh. David, David Blakelock from UniSA has also put in um, a comment around the Hi, idea. David. <laughs> uh, around the idea of drawing as a form of, form of language and I know you both know him but uh, as drawing uh, talking about drawing as a form of language often gets a lot more traction uh, in in teaching institutions particularly uh, and yeah. the value and importance of drawing um, and how we justify the processes of teaching and justify it to students justify it to other mm -hmm. colleagues and given yeah. the state of Australian universities at the moment justify it in the state of the academy me, so to speak, when, when the arts and humanities are, are sort of um, diminished, well, it's, we're having to communicate the importance of this at a time when, you know, it's, it may be diminishing mm. uh, in the academy. So the importance of visual rhetoric, rhetoric and all of this, this stuff around creative industries, but a question from Mario as well is that how do we get to expand the attention of, on drawing when we are teaching in much more minimised capacity perhaps in yeah. sessions that are, that are now one hour instead of two or, or, or even less than what's they, what they once, once were in 2000 mm. where you know people were drawing all day and perhaps all, all week um, how do we start to have this facilitation about that tacit learning of of these skills that you know getting a level of expertise when these things are shifting and changing within the academy or have been for some time yeah, yeah I, I was what i was going to say actually is is that in some respects it, this can go back to what we were talking about or what you were talking about just now back to um you know very early learning with with children and 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 perhaps what we should be teaching them there is is to develop a visual intelligence so that they know and understand what it is that they're actually looking at when they when they see an illustration or a drawing or a painting or a photograph even and and actually um, and, 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 if, and if that can be instilled within them at an early stage, then it sort of stays with them as they, as they, as they progress, even if they don't necessarily go on to become artists or, or, or whatever. Um, I mean, Stuart, you mentioned just now, you know, that as, as kids go through school, 
I can't remember the exact words that you use, but that as as they look at literature, as they look at books or whatever, the the words start to increase and the visual imagery decreases. It starts to evaporate. I think that was the word you you you, you used. Well, um, if 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 we placed equal emphasis on the visual as we do with 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 the, with the words and and sort of had a, a, a you know looked at the visual intelligence side of things and tried to encourage that then i think it would be much better later on i, I really do i had to say that so you know I yeah hope that helps yeah yeah well i i think uh, you know ari you mentioned visual language um you know making kids aware that um not just about the act of drawing for themselves but just seeing uh, visual media out there and how uh, each of those works in relationship to other bits of visual language. You know, there, there are advertising com- campaigns, for example, that refer to something that came before that, you know, mm-hmm. and they rely on the fact that you know that they're referring to that visually. Absolutely. I, I was going to uh, talk a little bit on and play on the concept that you said around meta narratives and the importance of once something becomes meta, that you start to see it almost being embraced by the population. And that ties into the idea that children now are probably much more adept at being visually mediated with all of the sorts of things involved in, in their daily experiences and the things that they see and engaging with on iPads for, uh, you know, when things become meta, it seems to be sort of subsumed by society in how drawing and illustration goes. And I, I, I do, do have a question around whether you think that is more complicated to sort of justify drawing and illustration and, and, and how that works across all of these different areas of um, visual communication um, in the sense that people are so used to it, sometimes mm-hmm. un- unpacking the complexity, as you were saying, around metaphor, mm-hmm. how people engage with metaphor um, or, or how they engage with the different um, the different areas of individual in, in, inhibition and technology and social inhibition as well. Um, yeah, how, how those sorts of things are maybe getting more difficult to teach students when they're so used to being and seeing things as yeah. well. Yeah, it's true. I think there's there's some good um, work from, I mentioned them before, the Swiss Design Network. I don't know if you've read any of their work, but like Anina Schneller and Anna Scheuermann and those sort of people, uh, they talk about advertising design in that rhetorical sense that it's trying to persuade you to do something, but then kind of implicit in what they're saying there, they acknowledge that uh, it's persuading you by going above and beyond in some way. So therefore that acknowledges there's, there's a norm, there's a convention for whatever that field of advertising might be or that field of packaging design, for example. So if we were to look at something like um, pharmaceutical design to take a Swiss example, um, there's, there's a way those look, you know, you walk into the, the chemist and everything looks similar, right? It's of, it's of a kind. So it'd be extremely easy for a design student to go, well, I can just, make something that looks different to that. I can put it in a, you know, orange juice container and say, here's, here's your vitamin C pills or something. And yes, it would stand out through that kind of rhetorical flourish, if you like, that visual rhetorical flourish. But would it be, would it be trusted in the sense of this convention of, you know, especially in health where it's all about trust? Um, so th- those kinds of ideas, I think, are, are quite easy to grasp and quite easy to teach. Mm. And, and give students, a, um, you know, really fun opportunities. So, yeah, let's go crazy. Let's design something that really fractures the, the established way of doing something. And then we can look at and try and assess the costs of doing that, the risk of doing that. Um, yeah. Awesome. Um, well, we've got another comment from Maggie Horse who sort of resonates with the idea that you're both saying that you can't teach creativity, but you can certainly guide it. Um, and I think, you know, having less time to engage with those sorts of things and start to get people to think about visual narrative and maybe the hegemonic or homogenous way that things look and how we can disrupt that process as well is really important as we move forward. Um, one of the questions I will put to you towards the end is, is starting to sort of think about this within design and art education. Um, what do you think the role of the 
and I know you've both written, written pro prolifically around these sorts of things, but the role of, <laughs> but yeah, I've read your book too. <laughs> it's, it's great. Um, how, how visual communication is becoming a much more important part of the future of how we communicate and, and the idea that more students within creative industries and outside as well within the academy should be exposed to this because they are in everyday life as well. Well, every, everywhere we go, um, there's visual imagery. Um, and it, it didn't used to be quite like that, although I suppose you could argue that if you went back to classic classical times with the ancient Greeks and the Romans, that, you know, there were, there were mosaics and, and that there was graffiti and, and so on uh, around all the place. But nowadays, wherever you, wherever you go, wherever you look, you 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 are you are just bombasted with 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 stuff, so I I don't think it's difficult to um, to sort of justify what we do in an academic sense by by teaching kids this stuff. I I I, I I'm I'm quite happy with the way things are, and that's 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 probably how I feel right now. Yep. Yep. Yeah, it's it's critical thinking with a visual focus, isn't it? Really, that's yeah, that's what's required. I think. It's, it's not enough to think, well, we're moving towards a, a more visual society. Isn't that wonderful? It's like, no, it yeah. could be absolutely terrible. And, and lots of it is. Lots of it's yeah. diabolical. So it's it's our mission, yes. think, our responsibility to try and give people the critical tools to question that and, and respond, uh, in our cases anyway, respond visually to it uh, in hopefully in a constructive way that makes a, a, a better visual environment. And to question Fantastic. ethics and moral responsibility as well. Yeah, because I think absolutely. that comes that that comes a lot into it, in my opinion. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I've, I've been sort of talking a lot with students about the, a philo having a personal philosophy of design, which Stuart's mentioned yes. earlier, and, and Alan, you have um, in the concept of the polymath principle as well, yeah. the idea of building a, 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 a sort of a student that is well-rounded in the way that they think about history and philosophy and ethics and values yeah. and how they might be able to materialise that in a drawing process or illustration or whether that drawing works across UX and service design. So um, I might just wrap, wrap up um, here as we hit 11.55 uh, and, and uh, 12 o'clock and, and whatever hour it is over there in, in the UK for Alan. Um, and I just wanted to thank you both and uh, for engaging in this discussion. I think it's really important at this time uh, and given the current year that we've had and many of, many of us sort of wondering the way that the tertiary education is going to go and the importance of something like drawing and illustration as we move forward. So I wanted to thank you both for having the conversation and Stuart for the keynote earlier and Mario for opening this up. Uh, and just to discuss a little bit before we hit uh, the breakout sessions at 12.30. So we're getting a bit of a lunch break for half an hour or so before you can join those links via the DITA uh, website, which you should have sent out to you. Uh, so um, those three different sessions are drawing for illustration and thinking about drawing for illustration, drawing for animation, drawing for design and creative arts. And the facilitators there are going to uh, have, a, have a discussion with you and engage you in a bit of a practical workshop in which we'll be doing drawing activities. I know some people may not be able to join those sessions given that they are overseas and it's you know a, a very late hour as well. But I did want to thank thank you both for joining us and at least prompting, Thanks, this, dis prompting this discussion. Thanks, I think Mario as well. Yeah, it's been fantastic. Um, sort of start to the day and 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 uh, great conversations and great to hear both of your ideas on 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 this and how we can sort of take them into again uh into the academy into our research and into into our uh, practice of teaching as well so we'll come back at Again, there's a sort of plenary session to close and have a look at what people did at workshops. And the key thing for this event is to start a dialogue between international and national colleagues about the role of drawing into the future and its importance across all these different things that have been discussed this morning. Um, and it's just been fantastic. So these are the facilitations just to, to remember that uh, if you can't get into the Zoom link and they should all be functional and working, 
to type in the password Dita to make sure that you can do it. You can also follow us on Twitter at network underscore drawing. We'll be communicating out to all the attendees and people who've registered uh, both of these discussions and talks as we move forward and, and ways to connect with some of the colleagues via websites, et cetera. Um, and, and thanks for joining us um, before we hit our hit our session. So um, thank you very much to both of you again for joining us and, and um, helping connect this. And uh, thanks to our head of school and the team as well that uh, sort of brought this event together to be able to uh, communicate these key ideas and, and uh, organize things um, so that you could come on board in this new virtual fashion that we're all getting very used to. Um, so yeah, thank you very much. Well, thank you. And thanks for asking. I thoroughly enjoyed it. Yeah, thanks, Barry. Uh, great talking to you again, Alan. Yeah, and you, Stuart. Hope to see you soon somewhere in the world. Yeah, likewise. <laughs> Fantastic. Thanks to everyone that's attended. It's been great. <laughs> right. Cheers.